Hello and welcome back. This is the first video in Section 8, Extending Our App. This video is titled, Flask Debug Toolbar. In this section, we are going to cover three different Flask extensions that we will be adding to our app. We will also look at Flask Cache and Flask Assets. These extensions have a focus on speeding up our app while also providing some tools to help in development. In this video, we will cover the Flask extension, Flask Debug Toolbar, and how it can be used to aid development of our application. Flask Debug Toolbar is a simple Flask extension that adds a lot of debugging information directly into the web page. This sidesteps the need for a traditional debugger or a lot of print statements when trying to debug a part of your application. The first step is to install Flask Debug Toolbar with pip in the terminal. Just like all of the other Flask extensions we have used, we will need to initialize the extension in extensions.py. Then, we will import the extensions object into underscore init underscore dot py and register it to the application object. And that's all that is necessary for Flask Debug Toolbar. If your configuration object is setting debug to true, then the toolbar will appear. If debug is false, then it will be hidden. Now let's go to the web browser to see the toolbar in action, as well as explore all of its different features. As you can see when I load the home page, the toolbar is automatically shown because we are using the debug configuration object, which sets debug to true. If you don't want to see it or you're not using it, you can just click on the hide button at the top. Let's walk through its features. Clicking on the button that displays your current Flask version will display all of the versions of the Python packages you have installed with pip. This is useful if you have a bug in your code, which is caused by out-of-date software rather than your code. Next, clicking on the button with the label Time will give you a breakdown of how much time was spent on the CPU rendering the page. The next two buttons have to do with the HTTP request and response and allow you to see exactly what the browser requested and how the server sent back its response. The next button, labeled config, lists all of the Flask configuration variables, including config variables for the Flask extensions. The button labeled templates shows all of the templates that were rendered for this page load, as well as the data that was passed to them. Next up is the SQL Alchemy button, which shows all of the queries that were passed to the database and how long they took. You can even press the Select and Explain buttons. To get a list of all of the rows that the query returned and how the query was executed on the database. The logging button is for capturing any calls made to a Python logging object in the view. We don't use any of the loggers in the logging module, so there is nothing here. The route list button shows all of the routes in the application, which functions those routes are tied to, and which HTTP methods those functions accept. Finally, we have the profiler, which is disabled by default, so click the check mark and reload the page. Clicking the profiler button again shows a list of every function that was called when the page was loaded, how many times that function was called, how much time each call took, and what was the total time spent on all of the calls to that function. This is extremely helpful when trying to speed up your application, as your intuition of what is slowing down your app is a lot less accurate than the real information and can lead to a lot of wasted time. So to wrap up, we have installed a very useful extension that provides a lot of information when developing our application. It saves a lot of time when trying to debug, as well as help identify the bottlenecks in your code. In the next video, we will look at another Flask extension that will allow us to cache the results of functions in order to greatly speed up our app. This is video two of section eight, Flask Cache. In this video, we are going to introduce another Flask extension called Flask Cache and show how it can greatly speed up your app. Flask Cache is an extension that allows the results of Flask view functions and normal Python functions to be held in memory after they are executed once. When the function is called the next time, the function will not run again. Instead, the results of the previous run will be pulled from memory and returned. 
This can result in huge increases in the speed of your app. First, we need to install Flask Cache from the terminal with PIP. As with Flask Debug Toolbar, we now need to initialize the cache object in the extensions.py file. Then, we will import it into the underscore init underscore dot py file and register the cache object on the application object. Now let's cache the result of a view function. Using Flask Debug Toolbar, we can easily find a slow page that can benefit from caching. One of the slower pages in our site is the individual pages for movies, as they have a lot of database queries. For example, this page has nine different queries and takes 17 milliseconds to render. Let's use Flask Cache to cache that page and see the difference caching can make. In the Dev Config object, Add a line which sets the variable cache underscore type to the string symbol, which tells Flask Cache to save the results in memory. There are a lot of different ways to store the results of cached functions, but the simple option will work for most cases. Having this in the dev config is just for demonstration, because you don't want pages to be cached while you're actively developing them. Now, in the main.py file in the controllers folder, import the cache object and add the following decorator to the movie route. The timeout value is the number of seconds that the cached value will live before the app will grab the result again. The value you set this at will depend on how often you think the data on this page will change. As the movie data very rarely changes, we can set this to a high number. Now let's look at the page rendering time again after two page loads to have the result stored in memory. As you can see, the rendering time dropped from 50 milliseconds to 0.3 milliseconds. Great! In this video, we demonstrated how caching the results of your pages can greatly speed up the page load time. This will give your users a better experience and increase the chances of people staying on your page. In the next video, we will look at another Flask extension, which will apply some filters to our static files in order to further speed up page load times. This is the third and final video of the eight sections of this series, which is titled Flask Assets. In this video, we'll be looking at a new Flask extension called Flask Assets. Flask Assets will add another speed boost to our application by applying various filters to our JavaScript and CSS files. Here's how Flask Assets works. In your web browser when you load a page, the first thing that is downloaded is the HTML code of the page. After the HTML is fully downloaded and parsed, the page will start downloading the JavaScript and CSS files. The web page will only fully render once all of the JavaScript and CSS files are downloaded. So, now that we have already sped up the creation of our HTML, we can speed up the downloading of our static files with Flask Assets. We can achieve this because Flask Assets does three things. First, it concatenates the contents of multiple files into one file. This reduces the overhead of multiple HTTP requests, and many browsers can download many static files at once. Thus, reducing the number of files, even without reducing their size, means the browser can download more files at once. Secondly, Flask Assets can strip all white space and line returns from files, 
which can reduce the size of the concatenated files by up to 30%. Finally, Flask Assets modifies the HTTP response of our static files by telling the browser to store the static files locally. Every time the user now visits the page, the browser will just pull the static file from the logic storage rather than downloading it from the server. Flask Assets can also handle compiling your LESS and CSSS files or your TypeScript and CoffeeScript files to CSS and JavaScript files respectively. Many of you might have used a program like Grunt or Gulp in order to solve this problem and might be asking, why don't I just use those instead? There are so many problems with those built systems. One is that Flask Assets automatically detects changes in your files and reapplies your filters with no interaction on your part, and configuring Gulp or Grunt for live reload is trickier. Secondly, if you used Grunt or Gulp, you would have to write JavaScript. As always, the first step in using a new extension is installing it with pip. We'll also install the CSS min package to handle compressing our CSS files. Flask Assets is able to handle compressing JavaScript files, so there is no need for an extra package. As with Flask Debug Toolbar and Flask Cache, we now need to initialize the Assets Environment object in the extensions.py file. Then we will import it into the underscore init underscore dot py file and register the assets underscore environment object on the application object. Flask Assets calls the groups of files that it concatenates together bundles. So we will create a separate file to contain all of our bundles called assets.py. In assets.py, the first bundle we will create is a bundle for our JavaScripts file. We have two of them that need to be compressed together, jQuery and bootstrap.js. We have to pass the file paths to the bundle object in order for Flask Assets to know where the files are located. After that, we have to specify the filters we want. In this case, we will be passing a single string, but you can also pass a list of strings. Then the output keyword argument will specify where the resulting file will be held. Using the same steps, we also create a bundle for our CSS files. Next, the bundles need to be registered on the assets underscore environment object in the underscore init underscore dot py file. This can be done with the register method on the object. Finally, we have to change the base.html file to use our new static files. Because the URLs for the new static files are dynamic, we use a Jinja control block from the Flask assets to add in the link to the file. In the control block, the URL to the file is exposed via the asset underscore URL variable, and we have to repeat this step for the JavaScript bundle. Using Flask Assets on single bootstrap CSS may seem a bit redundant since we already have a minified version in our project, but using Flask Assets would help us to extend and maintain our app in the future when we may decide to add more CSS files. Now back to the browser. We can re-examine the network requests of our page. As you can see, there are now less requests If we click on each of these requests and examine the headers, you can see that Flask Assets adding the HTTP headers to tell the browser to cache the file. You may wonder why we still see jQuery.js in the requests. 
And the reason is that Flask Debug Toolbar comes with its own version of jQuery. If you check the Network tab or the source code, you can see our bundle. One final note. While developing, it's not very useful to have your files compressed as it makes debugging harder. You can disable Flask assets in development by editing your dev config object to set the assets underscore debug variable to true. Let's also replace minified jQuery with the original file. I'm going to download it using a simple curl command, but if you want, you may use your browser on GUI. Now let's update our bundle. Let's just replace the minified version with the original version so we have control whether to minify it or not using Flask assets. Let's test our app again. Now with assets underscore debug variable set to true, we can see original files, so future debugging may be a bit easier. Great, that brings us to the end of this section. Let's wrap up what we have accomplished in this section. We've installed three different Flask extensions, Flask Debug Toolbar, Flask Cache, and Flask Assets. These three extensions have made our app faster, more responsive, and easier to develop and debug. In the next section, we will look at using a task queue called Celery to do tasks asynchronously.